Hello all you beautiful people out there. Wrestling luminary Matthew Murr is here to bring you a very special conversation with the legendary Mr. Wonderful, Paul Orndorff, one of the few wrestlers in existence to be inducted into all three major Hall of Fames. The Professional Wrestling Hall of Fame in Wichita Falls, Texas, the WWE Hall of Fame, and the George Tragos Luthez Wrestling Hall of Fame in Waterloo, Iowa, as well as the University of Tampa's Hall of Fame for his incredible college football career. Paul Orndorff began wrestling professionally in 1976 and quickly made his way to the top of the world, headlining the very first WrestleMania by teaming up with Rowdy Roddy Piper to take on the duo of the immortal Hulk Hogan and beloved 80s pop culture icon Mr. T at Madison Square Garden. A main event bout that would be declared the Pro Wrestling Illustrated Match of the Year in 1985. The following year, in 1986, Mr. Wonderful would also be declared PWI's most hated wrestler of the year and win Feud of the Year for his battles with Hulk Hogan, a war that still stands as one of the most profitable feuds in wrestling history. Throughout his career, Paul Orndorff would collect multiple titles, including becoming a four-time NWA National Heavyweight Champion, an NWA World Tag Team Champion, a WCW Television Champion, and a two-time WCW World Tag Team Champion before becoming a trainer of numerous wrestlers for Ted Turner's World Championship Wrestling. It is with great honor that I proudly present this absolutely absorbing conversation with a true legend of the squared circle. I hope that you enjoy Wonderful, the Paul Orndorff story, just as much as I enjoyed making it. When I was 14 years old, 13 or 14, I started going to the gym. And Tampa is really known for their gyms. They have really good gyms. When there was a gym that was in the north side of Tampa that was called Harry Smith's, I joined the gym because uh, uh, some of my coaches told me about him. And he was, uh, he was Mr. America. He won all these, uh, he was a, he was a, not a real big tall guy, but he was big. And I had never seen nobody like that. I mean, he had 20, 21 inch arms, his legs were huge and this and that. And when I saw him, I went, I want to look like that. He took a liking to me. He knew who I was because of my football career and, and track. I shot put and discus and broad jumped. I held the state record for, for all of them. I started um, going to Harry's to gym, and it was about 22 miles, I think, one way to his gym. And I did that, me and, a, and a, another person that could drive did that. And then when I got, I uh, kept going there. And then when I got to be about 16 years old, I could drive. So then I would do it. And I, I did that five, six days a week. And I'd done that for years. And he really took a liking to me. And he kind of trained me and everything. And at one time, um, I was thinking about getting into the bodybuilding, you know, contest because I look pretty dead gum good. But I didn't. You want a book about me and the way I was and the way I was brought up from a pig pen and what I had to wear to school and stuff. Uh, it's emotional. Lived in a trailer that was about 22 feet long, yeah. me and my dad. Where was your mother? Another man. Let me tell you who raised me. A neighborhood. Palm River, Florida. And they did a damn good job. I was recruited by the Navy SEALs. And Vietnam was going on then. I ain't going to stay here and tell you that I wanted to go to Vietnam, but I would have. And if I had the boom, I would have. And then the football colleges was uh, pressuring me. Are you going? I mean, I had college all over the country that they would fly me one weekend, I'd go and I'd go in the weekend, I'd be out there the next weekend and the next weekend and the next weekend all over the country. In other words, I had to make a decision. <laughs> so I went to University of Tampa, I stayed home. 
I played with John Matuzak, Freddie Solomon, Buddy Carter, and we were one hell of a team. We were the best small college in the country. We played big schools and beat them. We were that good because we had a bunch of wild animals on that football team, and I was one of them. We were men. We were, we were men playing a boys game. I've had concussions and stuff, broke my neck and stuff, and I regret none of that. I mean, I, I'm glad I did that, and I'm glad I went to the University of Tampa. I played my football and was drafted by the New Orleans Saints, went to college, got a scholarship, did all this and that and whatever, All-American. After the football, I, I got tired, I got burnt out. Burnt out. My father-in-law, Ross Maxwell, was like a father to me, and my mother, Wanda, and I'm, you know, I was married to the daughter of Rhonda. I was laying on the floor in their house uh, watching TV and wrestling came on. And I was watching the TV, I was watching that wrestling and I hadn't really watched it because it was all fake and phony and it just didn't look real to me. I kept watching that after a few weeks. I said, Ross, I can do that. I can do that. He said, <laughs> because I was living with them, and he said, I'll see what I can do. He said, Paul, uh, I got a name for you that you have to call the here's his phone number, and they said to call him. It was Eddie Graham. Eddie Graham was the promoter in wrestling in Florida. He said, I'll give you a trial, and that's when I met Hiro Masuda, and a couple weeks they called me. And they said, Paul, yeah, come down on a Saturday and uh, be there about uh, 12 o'clock, I think. And I did. And I'd been doing exercise and I've been working my legs. I've been doing all this stuff. Well, I wasn't a normal person. If it came to a fist fight, I would have whipped their ass. There ain't no doubt about it. There's none. I was a street fighter. I fought street fights. I fought for money in street fights back then. I've done that. People that, oh, come on. I'm telling you the truth. But they knew how to wrestle and they knew how to hook. And they got me in some of them, and you know, and I, it, it really pissed me off. But I handled it good. They heard Hogan. He was gone. They heard him. And they tried to do it to me. But I was a different kind of horse. I wasn't six foot six. I didn't weigh 300 pounds. I was 5'11", and I weighed 220 pounds, and I could go. After we got and everything, they said, okay, come back tomorrow. This went on for nine months. Come back tomorrow. Come back tomorrow. What they did is they got me to do these Hindu squats. You know, and, and it's like this. You know, this. Except I used to jump forward and then come back and do the Hindu squat. And what it was, it made it a lot harder to do. But it'll get you in shape better than anything you've ever done. Guarantee it. And I did those, I was doing 500, I've done 1,000, I've actually done 1,500 of them before without stopping. That's unreal, I'm telling you. There was nobody in this world that was better shape than I was at that time. Now I weighed about 223 pounds in it. And I was ripped. You were Masuda training. You were gonna make it or you weren't gonna make it. They said, Paul, now it's time for you to go. I can't remember all the towns, but I went there and stayed there for three or four months. And I was there for three or four or six months and I was out of wear and then did it for, for about two or three years. Bill Watts is, was the key to my success, he really was. And I worked for him several, several times. I knew his family, he let me, he even let me live over there in his house, you know, for a while, or he had another house, and he let me stay in it and didn't charge me or nothing, he, he took care of me. And, and I was having matches, but, I guess they weren't right. I, I, I'm greener than you know what. 
And Bill Watts, he took me and he took me in the back somewhere and he said, Paul, this ain't getting it. He said, I'm going to give you one more day, Paul, and then I'm going to have to let you go. Now, I had a family. I had a wife and I had a child. And I was saying to myself, oh, my God. I was freaking out. I got one chance to be with a guy that's very well known in professional wrestling and that everybody that he has are good. They're good, because he was a, a college wrestler. So he knew, you know, he knew stuff. Boy, 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 I mean, I went through hell that night. My buddy that next day, all hell broke loose. I wasn't even the same person. I was doing moves that I didn't even know I knew I knew. I was doing slams, I was doing suit places, I was bam, I was back dropping, I was doing it all. And then after a while he came and he said, now you can stay. That's what I wanted to see. I was starting getting my poo poo together and I could lead a match, I could call a match. I knew how to get heat, I knew how to take bumps and I was, it was working. I could be a main event now and draw money. Back then, when you got into wrestling, you had got to want to love it. You can't just have, it ain't gonna work. Because you're traveling, you're away from your family, you're this and that, and I was away from my kids. And it was tearing me up. And if you wanted me to be away from my kids, you're gonna pay me or I'm gone. And I could have went anywhere in the world I wanted to, anywhere. I went to Japan many, many times. you got to have experience. And when I said I went every six to seven, eight months to another state, I went there and worked with other guys. So I learned how to do things that they did. And that's how you learn. You learn by going to different things and doing it for several, several months with different people. And then when you get right, when you got it all together and your poo-poo is right, then you go to the big places. New York and Vince McMahon. Brother, <clears throat> back when I was doing it, if you were the main event in Madison Square Garden, you were on top of the world right there. That made you. You know, we were getting 30, 40, 50, 60. Me and Hogan uh, worked, I believe, in San Francisco. We had 87,000 people there. And I've been the main event, the first WrestleMania, being Roddy Piper, because Hulk Hogan and Mr. T. You gotta have a little showbiz, man. I don't care, but you gotta know how to do it. And I used to be a heel. I was asshole. People hated me, and I wanted them to hate me. Because I do whatever it took, and it didn't matter. I do whatever it took for somebody not to like me, because the more I'm hated, and I went for the money and didn't care about the after effects of it. <laughs> it was brutal. I mean, I've had my tires cut. <clears throat> I've had my windows broken out of my car. I got uh, a whiskey bottle in the ring. Somebody threw in a little whiskey and hit me. Got me 20 something stitches right, right up in here. When that happened, I was one pissed off man. I said, ain't no damn bike's gonna do that without me popping their butt. The cops and stuff weren't doing what they were supposed to do and then the fans were going crazy. They went to see me get my butt beat by you. You could be big and everything and then if you had to get in a fight and I got in a lot of fights when I was up in New York. But people didn't like me and if they tried to, you know, with me or something, hey, well, let's get it on and it would happen, boom. And I've had it happen more than once. It got to the point where I had to take a cab. And then it got to the point I had to take a police car from Madison Square Garden and different places where I went in a police car. I have taken cabs there and, now, and then once I, they found out that I was in a cab or whatever, I couldn't do it. They, they tried to shake the car to flip it over. You wouldn't believe it. The people went cuckoo. 
But you know it, the more they did it, the more money I made. You know what people don't like? The truth. Tell me somebody better. Tell me that somebody had a better body, that had psychology, that had a whole head of hair, and that could be pissed off and showed it. I had it all. And I know I had it all. I know it. But my paycheck showed it. There are people that come up to me to this day and say they still go to the gym and they remember all this and that and whatever in there. It did make an impact, it did. Some people don't like me, that's okay, I don't like them neither. That's the way I am. There will never, ever be another Roddy Piper. No doubt about it. He taught me the psychology which I needed to really, to really learn. And there was nobody, nobody better than Roddy Piper when it comes to the psychology of why am I doing this? There's a reason why. And he had it, he had it down pat. It just came to him because he was smart. When it came to that, he was smart. There was not a better talker. His interviews were the best. He was very emotional when he had to be. He knew how to control the crowd. And that's the key. Is to control those eight to fivers out there that make $2.25 an hour to control them to not like what you do. And if you can do that, they're gonna bring their friends and their friends are gonna bring their friends and before you know it, everybody is going to the wrestling and they're selling it out. It's because of the psychology of it. And the guys that were doing it, it's a special type of person. They're not here no more. There was some back then, but there wasn't a lot. But we had promoters and stuff that knew what they were doing. Me and Roddy, were, we were together, and we were headed somewhere down the road. The traffic was so dead gum bad that, my God, to go, to go from the airport to a hotel which is five miles away might take 35, 40 minutes to get there. I'm not built that way. I got so mad, and Roddy was egging me on. I started doing the damn steering wheel and I broke the whole damn, st ripped the whole column thing off and we were right, just pulled into the parking lot and I had to get a record the next day. I freaked out and he kept egging me on and it, it worked because he did it so damn, <laughs> he did it so good. to see him dead. It's emotional to me. He was my buddy. He helped me so much. <clears throat> if I had been for him, I don't know if I'd been Mr. Wonderful. Roddy Piper was the smartest guy that ever I've ever known in wrestling. <clears throat> Anybody. Because he used his brain more than anybody. And I hate to see people die. I mean, when they're your friend. I went to his funeral and everything. Quiet like a baby. <clears throat> Himself. himself to get me. I met him. 
Went to the office and met them and everything. They gave me a weekly salary, a damn good weekly salary. Atlanta did good. We were good. I mean, we sold out too at the Army. I mean, we, we sold it out, but it, but it always had good crowds. I mean, good crowds, a good payday is what I call it, because I did it for the money. I loved the business. I loved everything that I've done about it, but when it all boils down to it, I ain't gonna just love it for fifty dollars. I want what I was worth, and that's the bottom line. People say, "Oh, that's cocky or this or that." No, it is. If you're worth five hundred or six hundred dollars a night, and they're only giving you one hundred and fifty, that promoter is getting rich, and that ain't right. It's okay for him to get rich, but how about you? That ain't right. That's why there's no more rest. Ted Turner, I ended up uh, working for him for about eight or nine years. And uh, I, after I got through the wrestling pretty much, then he wanted me to train people, train wrestlers. So I started training them. And a lot of them <clears throat> went in to be good professionals, damn good, because I taught them the way I was taught. And the way I was taught was, it wasn't easy. It wasn't like it is. That's why there's no more wrestling now. Because these guys go, oh, I want to be a wrestler. Okay. And then they throw them in the ring and pff, they can't even tie their boots. They don't know how. When I got out of there, when I quit, that hurt. Them. And they knew it. And if I was there now, they still would be doing okay. There's a lot of psychology in the wrestling. Because you do things for a reason. And the way I was taught. If I do this when I'm doing it for a reason for this, and I'm doing this for a reason for that, and, and you have to do, that's how I was taught. And it ain't easy. But the stuff they do now is a joke. <sighs> Anybody can pick somebody up and slam them. You can backdrop them. You can suplex them. I can suplex them. I can drop toe hold you. I can do all this and that. That's easy but you gotta do it at the right time. You know what I mean? It's just like football. Football, you know, there's psychology in football too, cause I play pro football. You know, when some of the things they do and everything, you know, in the quarter, in the quarter, in the quarter, and then that last quarter is when you see all hell break loose. And that's when you see the, you know, stuff start really happening, you pick it up. It's the same way. <clears throat> there's psychology in every sport there is. It's just, it's a lost art. I know it. There's a few other people that do know it. But yet, <clears throat> you'd have to pay them to do it. And I ain't doing it for nothing for nobody. And you gotta have the talent. You gotta have the right people. You gotta have freaks. You know, you know wrestling is nothing but a freaks. And back in my day with Hogan and Piper and and um, golly, the Valentines and uh, just people, you know, like that, it didn't get no better. <clears throat> it, it probably will never ever be seen in like that again. I don't think, I wish it would for the, for the wrestlers sake so they can make a good living. The TV is so good now, there's so much of it. If, if it was like the way it was when we were doing it in the 80s and right there towards the, the middle of the 90s, <clears throat> it, it'd, be, it'd be huge. It, but you know what happens too? They overdo it. Because you get people that don't really know what to do when it comes to the matches when it comes to what they're doing in the matches because they think if you flip flop that that's a match. It ain't a match, it's a psychology. That, it's just like a movie show. If you watch a movie show that's any good, they have a psychology in what they do in the beginning. What they do here, what they do there, what they do at half, do. And then comes the last five or 10 minutes of the TV show. NCIS is my favorite show. Gibbs. I watch it every day of the week. <laughs> Law and order. I watch it. 
But NCIS is the best show on TV in my book. Nothing compares to it because they do it pretty dead gum good. All of them do. And she's pretty good looking too. What, what you gotta have is a guy like Trump <clears throat> that's so wealthy that he's willing to get somebody to train him and then him try to get it going again. Now, I'm just saying, it would take somebody with that kind of money. I like to do autographs, and I'll tell you why. Um, I get to see people that watched me when I was there, and now they bring their kids out of 27, 25, 28 years old, and they remember me when they were still pooping in the diaper. And they say, I remember you. I remember you, Mr. Wonderful. And I hear them like that, and I just, and then take a picture with the, the, the girl that look at their kids or, or this or that. Man, it don't be no better. I'll let you look.